When I was young, I used to say that I wanted to change the world. And at the time, I don't think I fully understood the full weight of that sentence or what it implied, yet I was using the words to suggest that I, a singular person, had the capacity to change a planet with 7.125 billion people. Yeah, it sounds a bit audacious if I say it like that, but <laughs> back in 2005 when I was a sophomore at U of M, I hadn't yet made the mistakes that have reshaped my thinking on what it means to do good and a concept I would like to call pragmatic idealism. So to me, pragmatic idealism isn't so much about changing the world, it's more so about doing my part to better the world. All right, so some context behind the concept. First visited East Africa when I was eight years old. It was a trip to Kenya. I spent most of it hanging out of a safari jeep looking at animals, and then on the last day, we went to a village, and I remember two things. The first, this day-old goat, it peed on my shirt. <laughs> and the second thing was the kids. They tried to peel the freckles off of my arms and my face. We sang songs to them in English, they sang songs back in Swahili, and we all ate chewing gum. It was great and had a lasting impression on my life. So 11 years later, I returned to East Africa, this time to Tanzania, and I was teaching primary school. I had 165 students, thank God, not all at once. And they too were awesome, it was great. And I showed back up at Michigan as a junior, and I realized that the experience probably was more beneficial and impactful to me than it was to those kids. And so this is when I began to question, what does it mean to do good? And I thought maybe I should do something more sustainable, something that would last longer than when I was visiting Tanzania. Did some basic internet research and came up with maybe not this totally uh, innovative idea, but this idea of building chicken coops, thinking that chicken coops could, yeah, they could be sustainable, but they could also be a nutritional and an economical resource for the community. Um, and particularly for disadvantaged kids, maybe kids living in an orphanage or a children's home because they could both eat and sell the chickens and the eggs. So in theory, this might have been a good concept, but in reality, not so good. The angle of the first chicken coop wasn't quite right, coop flooded. Second chicken coop was infested by really nasty rats. They ate some of the chickens. <laughs> and then, yeah, it happened. And then the third chicken coop um, was built on the second highest mountain in Tanzania. So. Um, only half of the chickens had good views. The other half actually died from the cold. But the biggest problem of all, the chickens weren't going to help the kids get into school to learn, to earn a better future for themselves. So yeah, studies show that if you have kids eating nutritious food, they perform better uh, than hungry kids. But in those studies, the kids are enrolled in school. And in the Olavolos village, many of the kids were not. So again, come back to Michigan and start thinking, what does it mean to do good? And what is pragmatic idealism? And I'd realize I need to shift from my approach. My first approach was basically founded upon crappy internet research and um, do something much more nuanced and integrated, something that fit with the community. And I'm not talking about some wonky development ideology I'd later learn about in grad school. Much more simply put, I'd have to realize my own limitations as a young, white, American female wandering around Tanzania, and start listening to the community and the, through the lens of other people. So fast forward two years or so, I had started the Olavolos Project. Olavolos was the name of the village where we built the third chicken coop, the one on the mountain with so many out-of-school kids. And I thought that, um, the mission of the organization should be to provide equitable educational opportunities um, to help get some of these kids into school. And so that's what we started out doing, and the organization was off to a good start, but I'll be honest, I was making mistakes. For example, I uh, listened to a man who told me he was a lawyer and that I, a foreigner, could purchase land in Tanzania. This is, in fact, illegal. But he wrote up the sale agreement. I paid 7.2 million Tanzanian shillings, the equivalent of about 5,000 bucks, and ended up with land that was no good. 
So yeah, the second time we bought land, we made sure to work with real lawyers. And we found a plot that could be what we wanted it to be, which was a nursery school. In Tanzania, <laughs> the primary school, primary school is free in Tanzania, but nursery school isn't. So what happens is you get kids like this, Yusuf, who enter formal schooling two years behind their peers, and it's really tough for them to catch up. So we started the nursery school. We hired a full-time staff at points in time. There was 10 Tanzanians working for us. Um, and we we're doing all sorts of things. The community would come up with something, and we'd try it. So we had a livestock program, agriculture project. We were working with women. We were working with adolescent girls. And we had a backyard with maize and greens and beans. And then we had cows, goats, chickens, rabbits, even dogs and fish at one point in time. And then the next day, we got fresh water, dug a borehole, hit fresh, clean water. And then we lit the whole place up with electricity, or as James likes to say, power. We are <laughs> yes! As you can see, this site had become an amazing resource for the community, and especially for the kids. Education becomes the direction to reach the place he or she dreamed. Education is the only realistic way out of the terrible poverty. That education will be yours. No one will come to steal it. On December 23rd, 2012, our site was taken over by force. Our security guards tried to protect the land, but actually were stabbed while trying. And there was a Kenyan woman behind this scheme. She was the one who had received the third chicken coop, the one we built on the side of the mountain for so many out-of-school kids. And let me give you a bit of backstory on this crazy lady. Um, we had asked her to make the first of two payments on the land, because when we uh, were not registered yet, like foreigners, unregistered organizations can't buy land. So we asked her to make the first payment. She said yes, agreed in writing that when we made the second payment, we'd get the name under the project's name. And we did that. We thought we were all set. But this woman showed up in court, claimed that the land was hers, showed evidence of the first payment, never mentioned the second payment, and said that I, singular person, had stolen the land from her. Now, this woman had been causing havoc for a while. We knew that she was corrupt. She had been doing things like intersecting shipping containers that we were trying to send from Ann Arbor to Olavolos, filled with stuff for the kids. Um, at one point, she was charging volunteers to pay for kids to get tested for HIV when the government does that for free. And another point in time, she tried to get me deported. Actually, that happened at least twice. Um, but I got to say, I could have never predicted that she would have successfully stolen the land from us. How do you deal with the fact that you are losing something built with funds from friends and family? Where the classrooms and the walls had been painted by your own students. And that had given kids a safe place to learn and to play. From a practical perspective, we made do with what we could. We uh, rented a space nearby and we kept the nursery school running. But from an ethical and an emotional perspective, it was tough. And I'll be honest, there's no answers in textbooks. There's no textbooks on these topics. In the nonprofit world, people talk about impact, and they talk about success. So 10 years later, I'm still thinking about these questions. And it's been about two and a half years since we lost the land. We're still trying to get it back. It's been slow, and I'm trying to be patient. What keeps me in it is the kids. And what would happen if we weren't around? We've got 21 now, enrolled at a great boarding school. And their progress is motivating. So you bet I was thrilled when I found out that little Miss Abigail skipped class one and went on to class two. And when Musa scored 48 out of 50 on his national science exam. But we're also realistic. And while we hope all of our kids are going to grow up to make positive impacts on society, we know they're going to make mistakes. So when Adiel decided to steal a watch from one of his friends, 
we had to take a step back and realize he didn't have the support that he should have had when he was growing up. There was no one to hold him accountable. So yeah, he's gonna make mistakes. And it's our job to give him the support that he both needs and deserves. <clears throat> you know, I can't tell you how many times I've thought about giving up with this project. And that Kenyan woman, my God. Um, how many times she's made me want to quit. But I have to realize that one of her best opportunities in life is to chase after my mistakes, and that the only way I can respond is by trying again, for the sake of these guys. Olavolos has enabled me to create a new framework for doing good. It's one that examines corruption beyond the individual stealing. It's one that's chosen to focus on 21 kids instead of hundreds. And it's also one that accepts both my mistake-making self and imperfect outcomes. I think it's important that all of us consider how we go about doing good in our daily lives. And I am in no way suggesting that you should go out and start a nonprofit in a foreign country. In fact, I'd highly discourage you from doing that. And if you disagree, maybe we should talk after this talk. However, other things, simple things. Being uh, a mindful consumer might be buying Tom's or buying a $15 bar of chocolate because it's bought from an entrepreneur that values good supply chain management and the proper pay of farmers. Or maybe you go and decide to only work for a socially responsible company. Whatever it is, I hope you can find something that works for you. I'm going to keep cheering on 21 kids in a small village in East Africa. The work out there is so far from perfect, so far. And I don't necessarily believe it's changing the world, but I am fully confident that it is bettering the world. Thank you, and go blue.